there were there were two guys in blue suits who had a hard time getting here because of weather. I'm one of them, but the one you're really clapping for is here. And <laughs> and and let me just say thank you for being here. Obviously, we've released what I think is the most important research product that a think tank could produce because it is the lever for taking back our schools for our kids and our parents and our families. So thank you for being part of it. And you know, Heritage is always around the country. I was in North Georgia one hour ago. That's why it was a little hard for me to get here, talking to several hundred people under the age of 40, which I used to be. And I, I said, you know, I've got to leave early from this conference because I've got to go down to Orlando and give a really big round of applause and platform to the state of Florida, all policymakers and Floridians for making Florida number one on that list, but also very importantly, and the crowd erupted, to introduce America's governor, Governor Ron DeSantis. Please welcome him. Thank you. Thanks so much. Great to see you. Welcome to the free state of Florida. What better place to celebrate education freedom than right here? So good to see everybody. Thank you so much. We appreciate the introduction, Kevin, and I'm glad that we're uh, hosting this. I want to thank the Heritage Foundation for doing this analysis and producing a report that not only honors Florida with the number one ranking, which we're proud of, but also uh, gives other states uh, something to strive for, and they can see who's doing certain things well, who's doing other things well. And although we finished number one overall, they did a bunch of different internal rankings. We weren't number one in every single one, so we're going to be working hard to make sure we can do even better going forward. A lot of this really comes down to, to leadership, and, and policy, and I think we've seen, unfortunately, over the last few years in our country, uh, how important policy is, both good, but also very bad. And it reminds me of a debate that some of our founding fathers had uh, back at the uh, beginning of the Republic, and it was between Benjamin Rush, Thomas Jefferson, and Benjamin Franklin. And the debate was over what was the world's oldest profession. And Benjamin... <laughs> Benjamin Rush was, a, was a, a doctor, and so Rush said, well, the world's oldest profession has to be the physician because Eve was cut out of the rib of Adam. And Jefferson, who had designed Monticello and, 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 and other uh, uh, buildings, he said, no, the world's oldest profession is the architect because it was the architect that had to bring order out of all the chaos in the universe. And Franklin said, no, uh, that's not true. Uh, the world's oldest profession is the politician. Who do you think created the chaos in the first place? <laughs> and all I can tell you is I see, particularly over the last few years since I've been governor, uh, virtually any corner of this state, you will see a lot of license plates from other states. You will see license plates from New York and New Jersey, which we're used to, the Midwest, which we're kind of used to, but you will also see them from California, which you never used to see when I was growing up. Uh, and that's a function of people uh, leaving poorly governed states to come to greener pastures. And we see it over and over again. And of course, COVID really accelerated that. And I think COVID, uh, it, when people look back at this, there's going to be so much stuff they're going to point to where a lot of those states made very bad decisions against the weight of the evidence and were very stubborn in not admitting their mistakes. But there may be no area where the contrast between a free state like Florida and some of the lockdown states uh, was but then on education because you had to make the decision, you know, do kids even have access to education at all during COVID? And many of these states decided that that was not something that they were willing to fight for. Obviously, they had a lot of political pressure from interest groups that support them, uh, like teachers unions, to lock these kids out of the school, uh, to force them into things that 
the remote, which was not working at all. You know, we do a lot of virtual education in Florida through the years, and so we were better than anybody, uh, but it's not the same thing. And when we did that for, for a few weeks in the spring of 2020, I told my education commissioner, this is, un this is unacceptable. We've got to have kids in school. Initially in COVID, you didn't necessarily know what role schools were playing in the transmission uh, of the virus. With flu epidemics, schools are viewed as one of the main engines uh, of that. Uh, but the reality was if you looked around the world and you looked in other jurisdictions like Sweden and others, you saw that kids being in school in person was not driving the epidemic and that, of course, kids were at very minimal risk from complications from COVID. And so taking them out of school was guaranteeing significant harms. Having them in school was showing that it was not really contributing to the scope of the epidemic in either, in either way. So that was something that we were looking at in Florida. And so I think it was June of 2020, I said, uh, every school district will be open five days a week. Every parent will have the right to send their kids to school in person five days a week. And that was a decision that was not, honestly not difficult based on the data and not difficult based on the evidence. It was very, very difficult just in terms of uh, the, the politics, the media, the, the left, the bureaucracy. Uh, they did not want to see the, the kids in school. And so we would have these stunts pulled by unions in Florida where they would actually bring coffins and put them down in front of the Department of Education building in Florida. You know, we had down in Miami, they would bring hearses and all this stuff. And they were basically trying to tell parents, your kids go to school, they're going to get sick, and then they're going to die. And that was false. Uh, they, I think they knew it was false, but if they didn't, what does that say about the fact that they're involved in education, that they can't even understand something so, so simple as basic data. But that was what they wanted to do. And you know, our view was, you know, we're not gonna let fear drive policy making. Uh, we're not gonna let special interest groups drive policy making. Uh, we're gonna make sure that we're there to support the well-being of our kids and also support families throughout Florida. Because when you talk about remote education, a lot of that falls onto the parents. And when you have parents that are working, it's very difficult. So we wanted to make sure to do that. Now, I will say in Florida, you know, majority of our teachers are not members of the teachers union. And so most teachers in Florida also wanted to get back. So even though the teachers union sued me and they were trying to get the courts to close the schools a couple years ago, uh, most of the teachers wanted to be back in the classroom because they understood how important it was. I mean, just think about it. You've dedicated your life to this, and then you have a union saying you're not really that important, that they can just sit at home on Zoom, and it's the same thing. I mean, to me, I, I view that as, as a slap in the face to, to the whole teaching profession that they were taking that position. So we had a lot of folks that didn't want to get back into the classroom, um, and we were able to do it. And so I said at the time, you can't just shut kids out of a normal life because you have a respiratory virus. Uh, you have to make sure that we're, we're honoring them and, and honoring their opportunities. And I said, it's gonna be really bad when uh, these other kids didn't have access to school and people didn't seem to care about that, certainly in the media and others. Well, now you have reports, seems like every other day, where they're talking about the catastrophic learning loss that you've seen. And who is that learning loss impacting? It's tending to impact people that are lower from lower income families. A lot of the lockdown politicians who were locking kids out of in-person education were all at the same time sending their kids to private in-person education. And so you saw this huge dichotomy with how people were going about it. Uh, but the learning loss and a whole bunch of other things that flow from that, that was something that was obvious was going to happen two years ago. That should not be viewed as a surprise to anybody. Uh, those people that locked the kids out made a conscious effort. Uh, they made the conscious decision to inflict that damage on them because they wanted to fulfill their own agenda. And the results of that are going to take a long time uh, to, to unwind. And I think if you look at the most recent NAEP scores, we don't have the, the state by state yet, but they did the national NAEP scores and you saw basically erasing decades of progress uh, across the board. And, and that's something that's gonna be very, very difficult. I would imagine when they do do the state by state that you will see the bigger declines were in the states that locked the kids out of school and the places that had the kids in school 
probably were able to manage uh, much better. So that is on those folks. Uh, that was not on the state of Florida because we stood there by uh, our kids and our parents. We were also good on looking at some of the other asinine policies that were happening during COVID. You know, the idea that you would isolate uh, college students at these universities and basically treat them like they're in a, a kind of a semi-prison where they can't interact with other people, uh, that was totally unacceptable in the state of Florida. And so in 2020, the summer, I said to the universities, do not police their social life. Let them be, be college students. And so they did that. And you know what happened? You had positive tests. You had up and down. And nobody got admitted to the hospital. I mean, these were kids that were not at significant risk of this. And so they were able to have a normal experience in terms of their, their social interactions. Some of these other places, when you're isolating these, these kids, they're pl getting plunged into depression, substance abuse, all these things. It was very counterproductive and very, very damaging. And even to this day, you have some of these universities in the Northeast making the college students wear masks. To this day, they're still doing this. So it's so bizarre how they've done it. We didn't let that happen uh, at our universities. We also saw that the CDC and others were really pushing mandatory masks for these K through 12 students, and particularly for the young kids. You know, that was something that, that we opposed. And so when the legislature passed the Parents' Bill of Rights, that I signed into law, I used that to issue an executive order saying you can't force mask the kids. Um, if a parent wants the kid to wear a mask to school, then that's fine. <laughs> but you can't force mask them. And the thing is, is you saw how this was so much driven by ideology. Now, for example, the American Academy of Pediatrics, they used to have things on their websites about the importance for young kids and their development to get the verbal cues and how that was like really justified by a lot of research. Well, they got on the forced masking bandwagon, so people would ask, hey, uh, why, whatever happened to the need to have normal interaction and verbal cues? They took that down off their website and they basically just tried to memory hole it. So, so much of this stuff that was being driven uh, was being driven by institutions that have really been captured by ideology and that have departed from evidence-based analysis and they were basically trying to just continue to fulfill whatever the narrative was at the time. But the data is very clear. Areas that forced mass versus that didn't in comparable situations, there was no meaningful difference in any type of COVID outcomes. But even if you could show a meaningful difference, you would still need to compare that to the damage of the academic development that suffered because you can't communicate properly. And I would imagine that that damage would far exceed whatever you know, hypothetical benefit you would have gotten for that. So we were able to do that. Some of the districts fought us. We, we went to court, we did all this stuff, and eventually we were able to win on that. Uh, the other thing we led on is the CDC and others would say, if somebody tests positive in a school, you find out whoever was in that classroom and they have to isolate Basically, they're healthy kids being forced to isolate. So that was going on, and uh, I talked to my, so we have Surgeon General that we got from UCLA, Joe Latipo, and I told Joe, I said, Joe, this is insane that this is going on. I mean, you have kids, they may have been in the same room, they don't have any symptoms of this, and so why are we sending them home uh, for 14 days? It's very disruptive, and parents would get called like the night before school, hey, Johnny can't go to school tomorrow, why? Well, he was in the cafeteria when somebody later tested positive. So we eliminated healthy quarantine and basically said, you know, if someone in the class tests positive, you can notify the parent if the parent wants to isolate their kid, then that's fine, but there's no forced isolation of healthy students. And so that ended the disruption that you were seeing in a lot of the school things. And when we did that, like everything we've done, they said the sky was gonna fall and everything. And of course, that didn't happen. That was the right thing to do. And now most districts around the country um, have followed us. Uh, we also led the way, this is very early in 2021, probably in the spring, the mRNA uh, shots had not even been authorized for, for school-aged kids yet. Uh, but we saw what was coming down the pike, and so we got through the legislature uh, a ban on any forced vaccine, uh, COVID vaccines for kids. And how they're going to try to deny kids 
access to school, like in Washington, D.C., they said, well, we're going to start doing this in January. You're taking kids, most of them have already had COVID, uh, and you're saying if you don't take this shot, which is not proven to have any benefit for kids of that age, that you're going to be denied an education. I mean, how did we end up, you know, in this situation? And so we were very strong on that very early on. So I think the way different places handled COVID uh, is going to reverberate in terms of the educational outcomes for these kids for quite some time. And, you know, we got the big issues right. Unfortunately, a lot of places around the country got the big issues wrong. Of course, here we're talking about education freedom and what uh, more, is more important than that than making sure that every parent in your state has the ability to find a good school for their kids, regardless of their income and regardless of, of other factors. And so we've been one of the leaders in the nation in school choice for a long time. We now have about 235,000 students across four different programs for private school choice. And so that's more kids on private scholarships than anywhere in the country by far. And that is uh, targeted by, by and large to low-income families, but what's happened over the years is that's been expanded so that more and more families throughout Florida are eligible. So our core school choice programs, you've got close to 85% of all families are eligible uh, for that. And of course, the ones that are in the top 15% of income could afford it anyways. And so that's as robust um, as you're going to find in most states in this country. We also have 362,000 students in charter schools, which are public schools, but they're not necessarily run by the school district and, and, and almost always free from influence of, of education unions. Uh, that gives parents the ability to choose. And we've been able to see a lot of different innovation with that. You'll have some charter schools that may focus on a certain type of profession. You'll have some charter schools that may focus on things like classical education, and you've had Hillsdale College come and do those. So it provides an, an opportunity for entrepreneurship in the education space. And our charter students, if you looked at their performance, and they skew more low income than the population as a whole, higher percentage of African American and Latino students than the population as a whole. If you just took our charter population, you know, that would be one of the top five performing uh, school districts uh, in, in the country, uh, if you look. So the, the, the performance has been really good, and we're happy with that. But what's happened in Florida is because you have private choice, because you have charter schools, well, the school districts have had to compete for these students. And so school districts have embraced choice within their districts. So if you look at a, a county like Miami-Dade County, it's the top performing urban school district in the country. 70% of students in Miami-Dade County go to a school other than their neighborhood school that they were zoned for. 70%. Now, when I was growing up, you know, I grew up in Dunedin, Florida. I went to Dunedin High School. That's just what it was. Now, they're able to look and they can make choices within the school district. They can make choices within the charter opportunities. And of course, most of them have opportunities for private uh, scholarships. So the, the total amount of that, 1.3 million students uh, uh, with private, charter, and within school district choice programs uh, is a huge, huge number and more than any other state uh, you know, by far. Uh, the results of this have been better performance really across the board if you look at Florida over the last 10 or 20 years. And we don't have the state-by-state -state NAEP results yet for 2022, but if you look at the ones that they did right before COVID hit, Florida ranked when you control for demographics, and the Urban Institute, which is a left-leaning group, did this analysis, Florida ranked number one in the country in fourth grade reading and fourth grade math on, the, on the, the previous NAEP. And so we'll see where we are here. I would imagine our losses were less than what the, the lockdown states were, uh, but that'll come. And then education weeks, quality counts, student achievement, K-12 achievement, we're number three in the country for K-12 achievement. So you can see that when uh, parents have options, they're able to find the school and the situation that's best for their students, their kids, that's better, obviously, to be in the right environment, uh, but it's also caused uh, competition, which has been healthy, and I think it's caused both the school districts, the charter, and the private to innovate. So we're really happy with that, and we think that that's a model for ways um, into the future. We've also worked very hard on recruiting uh, people into the teaching profession. 
because if you have a really good teacher, that can make all the difference. And so in the last two and a half years as governor, we've been able to raise the average minimum salary for public school teachers, including charter schools, uh, from 40,000 to over 48,000 with this year's budget. And if you think about it, there's opportunities for college people coming out of college. What do you wanna do? Fewer people want to go into teaching than maybe 25 or 30 years ago. And I'm not saying this is the only reason, but, but that certainly helps to make it more attractive. Uh, I do think that they don't want to be, by and large, part of, of schools if it's part of, a, of an agenda uh, by unions or other interest groups. And I also think school discipline is very important, and we're looking at ways where we can stand up for teachers in terms of ensuring uh, that disruptive students aren't able to, to dominate the classroom. But I think there's a lot of uh, things going on there. Uh, but the reality is, you, talk, you hear about a nationwide teacher shortage. Uh, Florida per capita is less than, I think, 30-some states in terms, of, in terms of our vacancies. And I think part of the reason is, is because we've done things like, like raise the average minimum salary. Uh, we've also enacted a military vets recruitment program so that if you've served for four years or more on active duty, you've been discharged honorably, you have a 2.5 GPA, and you have 60 hours of uh, of college credit, uh, you're able to get uh, provisional certification and you could be hired to go into the classroom. Now that passed our legislature unanimously, uh, but it's now been attacked by teachers unions because they say you can't just put any old warm body in front of students. Well, let me tell you, as a Navy veteran, our veterans aren't just any other warm bodies. Uh, they're people that have served this country. And I recently announced a proposal for next legislative session where we are going to embrace the idea of apprenticeships within the school system. At the end of the day, you can sit there in a college class and listen to some professor bloviate. That is not going to make you a good teacher. In fact, I don't know, a lot of times that's not even applicable for being in the classroom at all. So we really believe that getting hands-on experience and learning under the tutelage of somebody that has done well is probably the best type of education you have. So for people that have an associate's degree, they're gonna have an opportunity uh, to go in, work under the supervisor of an experienced teacher, learn how to manage the classroom, learn how to teach while they continue to accumulate credit, credit hours and eventually get their degree. And the teacher that is supervising uh, will get a $4,000 bonus. And so it's good for them as well to be able to do it. So I think we're putting proposals in place that's going to be able to meet the need uh, to have good people in the classroom. Uh, we're also a state that's been very strong on post-secondary education. Right now, our state, our higher ed, public higher education systems ranked number one in the country by U.S. News and World Report. One of the reasons that's true is because we are the most affordable higher education system in the country. Since I've been governor, there have been no tuition increases at our state universities. And so you can go as an in-state resident, you can go to University of Florida, Florida State, all these schools, average is about $6,300 for tuition for a year. There's not very many places around this country where you could do that. We also offer Bright Future scholarships, which will pay for either all or most of that tuition for a, for a pretty significant number of our students. And so our view is we don't want to just see universities escalate tuition. They make the, uh, their administrative staff gets bloated. They, they fund more bureaucracy and all these other things. It's not impacting the quality of the education. And you see it in these private universities where they've done all this. All these students that they're talking about in debt, why aren't the universities on the hook for this? They have made a fortune off these loans. And And, you know, Biden has this proposal, which is not constitutional because he's unilaterally putting almost a trillion dollars of liability on taxpayers without congressional authorization. But uh, if you think about it, there's no reform to higher education at all offered this. It's just basically like, hey, if, if, if you have debt, taxpayer will pick it up. I think it's $6,000 per taxpayer is what the liability would be. Those who work to pay their loans off, well, you're not going to get a mulligan on that. You're just going to have, have done it. Uh, so the colleges, they raise tuition. 
They have the loans that people can take out more and more. And if you're producing students going $100,000 plus in debt and they can't find gainful employment to be able to pay those debts off, then you are doing something wrong and you should be held accountable. We've also made reforms to our uh, universities in terms of tenured professors. And so I signed legislation this year that will require all tenured professors to undergo review every five years, and they will be able to be let go if they're not performing. And while we're proud of our universities and we're proud that it's affordable, we've also been very clear since I've been governor that a four-year degree from a traditional university is not the only way you su can succeed in life. And in fact, it's not always the best route for people to try to succeed in life. So we've embraced workforce education. Our goal when I became governor was to take us from the bottom half of states to become number one in workforce education by the year 2030. We're on our way to doing that. Uh, we've expanded the number of apprenticeships that are offered throughout the state of Florida. And our high school students oftentimes can get a credential where they're certified in a lot of these high demand fields and they have job offers right out of high school. And if you look at what we've done with our state colleges, we've expanded opportunities there for things like truck drivers or people like diesel mechanics to fix the trucks. You look at all the supply chain problems you've had, Part of it is you don't have enough people to be able to fill these spots uh, that are willing to do it. So we're making sure that we're, that we're standing up there. And the result is a lot of these students are going to go through no debt, and many of them will be making six figures within just a couple years. The truck drivers are making that immediately once they go. Uh, so let's just look to see where the opportunities are. And you're not any worse than anybody else because you didn't get a four-year degree. In fact, think of all the people that had four-year degree in zombie studies with $100,000 in debt, and then they end up in a job they could add at a high school. You look and compare someone that goes into electrical, they're making 75, 80 grand, then they're making 100 grand, then they start their own business in their mid-20s, and they start making you know, really significant uh, income. Uh, there, those are good pathways. And we're not telling you you have to do one or the other, but what we don't want to do is try to shoehorn every single student that comes through our school system into traditional four-year universities. They need to know there's a variety of paths you can do and find what's best for you and then pursue your dreams. And what we'll actually have is we'll have high school students that are pursuing both. They will take AP courses, but then they'll also get a certification in welding so they can see and, and, and enjoy those opportunities. So, so we're proud of that. I will say, though, since I've been governor, probably the most significant flashpoint that we've seen, of course, in Florida, but even all over the country, uh, has been our emphasis on the rights of parents to help direct the education and upbringing of their kids. And part of this was COVID, I think, awoke a lot of different parents to what was going on in the schools. I do think some of the really sharper ideological agendas have been more recent in terms of what they've been trying to do. And so this all came to a head over the last few years. And states like Florida have led by enacting a Parents' Bill of Rights, which we did in 2021. We also this year enacted curriculum transparency legislation. You as a parent have the right to know what is being taught in your kid's school. You have a right to know what is in, say, a middle school library. And when you hear about the left talking about saying, oh, you know, they're trying to, quote, ban books, just understand, adults can do what they want, but do you think it's appropriate for a sixth grader to have access to books with hardcore pornography in their library? Most parents don't. And so now in Florida, they have an opportunity to fight back and stand up for what is, what is in the best interest of their kids. We've also looked at all the, the curriculum and what, what's been going on in the schools. And our view is very simple, and we've just drawn a very firm line in the sand. The purpose of our school system is to educate kids, not to indoctrinate kids. We
We've done things like ban critical race theory in our K through 12 schools. And what you'll hear from uh, the left and the media is, oh, well, they just, they don't want to teach about uh, slavery or civil rights. Just know in Florida, all of that is required to be taught by statute. That is not what CRT is about. Those are historical facts, and you teach all of American history, but what you do not do is you do not distort American history to try to advance your current ideological agenda. When you have things like the 1619 Project that the New York Times, of course, underwrote, and they want to get that into schools, they say that the American Revolution was fought to defend slavery, and that's false. You can look at why they rebelled. You can look, I mean, the dang thing started in Massachusetts. That wasn't exactly, you know, the head of, um, of what was going on in terms of the agriculture. So, so that's, that's why they wrote pamphlets. They debated it. They talked about it. They listed different things. And that's just the fact. So what they're trying to do when they're doing those false historical um, uh, statements is they want people to say, you know what, this whole country, the founding of it, they want people to think it was illegitimate or somehow fatally flawed. And in reality, it was the American Revolution that was the first thing that ever caused people to question slavery in the first place. It had been an accepted part of human life. All of a sudden, now you're saying, you know, our rights don't come from a king or the government. They come from God inherently. Well, how can you justify having this? And so that really is what birthed a lot of the abolition movements. And so we just have to be accurate about that. And you know, the people on the left that believe in things like CRT, they're effectively taking the position on the American founding that Stephen Douglas did when he debated Lincoln. Lincoln took the position that it was a nation conceived in liberty and that it was the principles of that that would eventually you know, provide freedom across the board. And Frederick Douglass believed that too. Stephen Douglass said, no, 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 the purpose of the founding was to basically preserve slavery. So the modern day CRT advocates would have taken the side of Stephen Douglas when he was debating Lincoln in 1858 in the Senate. So I believe Lincoln was right, I believe Frederick Douglass was right, and I think most people throughout American history have taken that view. It's also something that is used, because they'll say, oh, there's no course labeled CRT? Where are you getting? Of course there's not. That's not what we're talking about. We're talking about using those principles to be able to teach a whole host of subjects. And part of what they want to do with that is they want to categorize people's worth based on their race. So if you have some kid, if you're white, you're an oppressor. If you're black, you're oppressed. And they want to have collective guilt imposed on people based on their race. And they want to scapegoat people uh, based on their race. And in Florida, we say that is wrong. Uh, we're going to treat people as individuals. We're not going to treat people as different as parts of different groups. And we're going to make sure people are judged uh, based on their character and achievement uh, and not based on the color of their skin. We're not going to be spending your tax dollars teaching kids to hate our country or to hate each other on the basis of race. But as you fight back against things like CRT, what we've done is we've put a renewed emphasis on American civics, on making sure that the kids that come through our schools have an idea of what it means to be an American, that they understand the principles that our Constitution was based off. They understand the Bill of Rights. They understand how all these key ideas really animated key parts of American history all the, all the way up to the present. And to this end, we've created a program where teachers can earn the civic seal of excellence. And they do this by going through a training that we've created that we consider like a civics boot camp. They go through the training, they get a $3,000 bonus. We've increased uh, the ability for civics and debate throughout the state. We had about 10 school districts doing this. Three years ago, now we have 60 of our 67 school districts are involved in the civics and debate initiative. And part of the good thing about that is when you're debating, they will give you the topic and they will tell you which side you have to argue. So you may be a, an, an ardent gun controller and they may tell you you got to argue for Second Amendment rights. And so maybe that will cause you to question some of the assumptions that you have. Maybe it'll help you think a little bit more critically about issues. Maybe it will actually cause you to think about the way other people may view these issues and get outside your bubble. So I think it's good beyond civics. I think it's helping them, helping our students think critically. And we also believe that 
uh, talking about American civics and American history should be done by comparing that to other systems. And so we signed legislation this year that November 7th of every year is a day for students in school to learn about the horrors of communism and communist regimes. And we are gonna honor the victims of communism as a state overall, but specifically in the classroom to know uh, who, what was the body count in the 20th century from Marxism-Leninism? It was over 100 million people uh, there. Why were people always trying to flee those regimes? Why would people go on a, on a wood raft uh, across um, the Florida Straits from Cuba to the Florida Keys, knowing that they probably aren't going to even make it alive. I don't see very many people going from South Florida to Cuba on that. <laughs> Why is that? What is different about a, a Marxist-Leninism society in which they believe in the supremacy of the state and deny the existence of a higher power, whereas our government is based on the idea of our creator endowing the people with inalienable rights and that the government is basically a function uh, of, of, of us. So those are very important and we're, we're taking on those head on. And then of course, you may have heard that we had a little bit of a, of a dust up earlier this year about whether elementary school kids should be exposed to woke gender ideology in their curriculum. And there were some people that wanted to do that. There are school districts across this country that are doing this. Let's just be clear. They will act like it doesn't, doesn't exist. You can look and see. They will have different guidelines in places in California, New Jersey, what you name it. And they basically want to say a first grader, well, you know, you were born a boy, but you really may be a girl, and maybe you want to identify that way. And in Florida, we said that's wrong. That is not appropriate for our schools, and it's certainly not appropriate to be going behind the parents' back and changing a gender of a student without parent knowledge or consent. The school should not be doing this anyways, but it was actually happening against the parents' wishes. Uh, so what we basically did with the parents' rights and education bill was we said, okay, when you send your kid to elementary school, uh, you can be sure that they're gonna be learning to read, write, add, subtract, the basic academic subjects, but they are not gonna have transgender ideology shoved down their throats. You can make sure You can make sure that you as the parent are going to be involved in any key changes in services that are being provided to your student in these schools and that you would have a right to object on that. Now, that's pretty straightforward and in fact if you uh, ask people about it overwhelmingly and not on a partisan basis, majorities of every demographic agree with, with what we did. Obviously, you had the media that were trying to demagogue it. You had the left that was kind of in a, in a real tizzy about it. But you know, the left understood that they cannot win elections on that issue because parents are not going to stand for it. And so what they did was they tried to subcontract out their activism to corporate America. And so they enlisted as many companies as they could, but they were focusing on Disney, which obviously has a big foothold in the state of Florida. And their, and their view was, if we get Disney involved in this, Disney coming out against it, then they're gonna cave and, and the, the governor will not be able to sign the bill. Uh, so they did uh, do that and, and Disney came out and was not honest about it and said, said that they opposed it. And people looked to me to say, okay, what are you gonna do? And I'm saying, I'm standing my ground right here. I am not moving anywhere. You know, at the end of the day, when you're, when you're governor, you know, you take an oath, you're, you're, you're taking an oath to support and defend the people uh, that you represent. Uh, you're not taking an oath to subcontract out leadership to a woke corporation based in Burbank, California. It's not what you're supposed to do. And uh, as much as I disagree with that position, I understand they had the, the, the right to do it, but they, they did pledge themselves after we signed the bill that they would see to it that the Florida legislature would repeal the parents' rights. And so it's like, okay, you know, you were kind of bullied into taking this position. Now you're saying you're gonna continue to wage uh, kind of a woke jihad against the parents of our state and our kids, you know, I'm not sure that that's something that, that, is, that is very appropriate. And so we just said, look, 
Uh, whether you have the right to do it or not, I mean, I think in terms of the shareholder value and fiduciary duty, it may be a violation of that. But put that aside. On a First Amendment basis, you have a right to do it. But you don't have the right to force us in Florida to subsidize your activism. And the fact of the matter is Disney was getting more subsidies than almost any company, and probably in American history, certainly more than anybody in Florida. And since the 60s, they've had their own government that they operate. Uh, they've had uh, exemptions from laws that all their competitors have to follow. And they've had massive tax breaks. And so all we said is, OK, that's a special arrangement. That's kind of joining this state with this one company at the hip. And if your values are get this gender ideology in elementary school curriculums, that is not the best interest of Florida. It's not in the best interest of our parents and our students. And so we are not uh, happy, no longer happy to have this arrangement. So we work with the legislature and now because we acted, uh, Disney is no longer gonna have its own government. Uh, they're gonna live under the same laws as everybody else. And they are going to pay their fair share of taxes in the state of Florida. So, so these are all important issues, and I think the reason why I think education is so important is because uh, you know, we need to make sure that our young students have a proper foundation uh, when they go out in the world. You've seen ideology infect so many different institutions. It's not just us fighting people on the left in legislatures and in city councils around the country. Obviously, that happens. Uh, it's now being done through big tech companies, through corporate America, universities, all these other things. And it, 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 it creates uh, a situation, you know, I think in which freedom is much more tenuous uh, than it has been at any time in my lifetime. And Alexis de Tocqueville, he made the observation uh, in, in the 1800s that uh, a tyranny in Democrat republics doesn't proceed in the same way that it would in a monarchy. Uh, it ignores the body and goes straight to the soul. The master no longer says, you will think as I do or die. The mass, you are, he says, you are free not to think as I do. You may keep your life, your property, and everything else, but from this day forth you shall be as a stranger among us. And so at a moment when we hear so much about the soul of the nation, here in Florida, we're standing up for education freedom because it's partially in our classrooms that the protect, uh, uh, perspectives of future generations are formed and where teachers and educators in whom we put our trust as parents can help provide our kids with a strong foundation for them to exercise the duties of citizenship in a republic. I thank the Heritage Foundation for taking uh, an interest in academic uh, education freedom. I thank you for coming to Florida, and we're honored to receive the number one ranking this year. God bless everybody. Thank you. Thanks. 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 Am I sitting down? Thanks so much, Governor. I'm, uh, by the way, really glad you got the memo about the boots. Right. <laughs> they're, they're the official footwear of the Heritage Foundation. Okay. Yeah. A few questions. Obviously, you're busy. We're very grateful that you took some time. And, you know, at, at Heritage, we tell the truth. We don't get into patronizing people, even, even elected officials we love. So this is heartfelt. That's a tour de force, and that's the future of America. So thank you. Thank you. Thanks. So let's cut to the chase. I, you, you answered really all of my questions. That's kind of hard to do for a bloviating <laughs> former history professor. <laughs> Speaking of professors, how about a round of applause for Jay Green, who did a great job filling in. <laughs> this is a curiosity question, Governor DeSantis. I know that as you were coming in as governor-elect, you had to know that education was going to be something you leaned into. I've been curious the last few years, this is the first time I've got a chance to ask you this, were you surprised, A, by all of the pushback you got from the usual suspects, teachers, unions, et cetera, and also B, in a good sense, the, the parents who came to your defense and said, you were right on target? 
Yeah, I mean, I think, uh, well, even before COVID, I got elected in 2018. I came in, we had had at that point, our school choice was effectively capped at about 100,000 students in terms of the low income kids, because it was a corporate tax credit scholarship program. I said I was gonna expand that and we were gonna make it a, a bigger program. Now that went uh, against current Supreme Court precedent in Florida. Uh, but the good thing is, is I inherited one of the most liberal Supreme Courts in the country, but within three weeks in office, I was able to replace three of the four liberals with conservative justices. And so, so we knew that we had a pathway because that decision that was made to strike down previous school choice was even criticized by like the Harvard Law Review as being a very adventurous reading of the Constitution. And so that was kind of the first fight. And the thing is, we anticipated getting sued by the unions, but they still haven't sued over it even to this day because I think they know they probably don't have a good leg to stand on. Uh, I think when we got into things like COVID, you know, that was really, really significant political warfare. Uh, I think that there was a, a different agenda at stake at that time. I think there was a lot of it. They wanted things bad for the 2020 election. I think they had other things that they were trying to do, but clearly the best interest of students was not there. And so of all the things we did, uh, the amount of blowback that we got, and this is June of 2020, was really, really intense. But you know, my view is, is I'll take the arrows. I mean, that's what a leader does. I'm happy to do that. I didn't honestly know how it would work out politically. I mean, I was very confident in the data and I thought that it would do, but I didn't know. Uh, but you have to stand for the right things. And if I'm saving their education, and then obviously with the other COVID stuff, people's jobs, you know, if that were to somehow put me in jeopardy politically, well, so be it. That's the price of leadership. And that's just what you have to do. I was, though, surprised because when we first had the kids back across the state, all the corporate media would show up at these schools and they were just like, they almost like, they wanted to see like kids just like keeling over or something. They honestly believe this coming down from like New York City or something. So they're there like just acting like all oh, these Florida yokels, they don't know what they're doing kind of deal. But, but I, and I knew it was gonna be fine. But literally after like four or five weeks, I thought to myself, well clearly you can't justify locking kids out of school given Florida has them in, you know, so a lot of, so there was other states too, you clearly can't, and they just persisted. They did not change. They kept doing what they were doing. The, the evidence was mounting all the time that they were wrong, and they just refused to do what was right. So that is, it's sad that that was the case, uh, but I was a little bit surprised because I just thought that the, once you saw it, you could, Fauci can say whatever he wants, but if you see it, why would you not then do that? And But it, it, what it showed is there was an alternative reality that was created, part of it by corporate press. Obviously, the bureaucracy had taken a position one way. They would never admit they were wrong on anything. Uh, but just the failure to open your eyes and consume the data and look at the experience. And that's what I would always say. You know, when you uh, look at, like, COVID, for example, I look back at Eisenhower's farewell address when he talked about military industrial complex, everyone remembers that, but he also talked about how with the rise of federal government funding a lot of scientific research, that there was a danger that public policy itself could be held captive by what he called the scientific technological elite. He was basically talking about a Fauci at the time. And, um, and he said that's not a statesman's role is not to subcontract out to a quote expert statesman's roles to consider information from all these different sources, but you've got to harmonize that, in, that, that, that information and figure out what's best for society as a whole. And one of the things that I always told myself was, I am never gonna just simply defer to an expert over observed experience. They said Sweden would, would, would crash and burn. It didn't happen. So I said Sweden was right and they were wrong. And that's just the way you have to do it. So that the school closures around this country uh, were very disgraceful that those continued. And it was almost all these deep blue jurisdictions. In fact, if you do the in-person percent for 2020, 2021, and you colored each state by who was in charge, it's almost all red to blue, almost all red to blue. That's just sad. I want to ask you one follow-up question about our report card. 
and a little bit of context there, and, and you know this well, as your staff does, people around this country are watching what's happening in Florida and a few other states that, that scored well on the report card. All of these folks in this room, as you know, are, are friends of, of your education reform and what Heritage is doing. We've got some special friends, Lloyd and B. Smith and the Pharaohs Foundation, who came to us in the last month and said, Kevin, you and the Heritage Foundation need to team up with Governor DeSantis, any governor, any state, that wants to completely dismantle the power of the teachers' unions. That leads me to this question, and it's, it's sort of a guy-to-guy -guy question in terms of competition. Florida's number one on the report card. You alluded to the fact that you're not number one in school choice. What might we look forward to in the future in order for Florida to be <laughs> number one in school choice? Yeah, well, look, I mean, I think, I think in terms of the union influence, I think you, people saw it. A lot of people didn't realize the influence that they had but when you have these bosses basically shutting the schoolhouse door on so many kids around this country, is that who should be in charge or should parents be in charge? And so we believe in Florida. You know, we believe in Florida that it should be parents and students. And the thing is, majority of our teachers are not members of the union. You know, but I think, I believe in paycheck protection. If you do dues, you should write out the check. There should be no automatic dues. You should write out the check and do it. If that's what you want, then that's fine. What we do in Florida, though, is we tell the teachers who aren't member of the union, we do the malpractice premiums, and we handle that, uh, which is the main reason why people want to do it. So that's all underwritten by the state of Florida. So there should be no pressure to want to do it if you don't want to. And a lot of the teachers, even some of the ones that are members of the union, are not happy with the leftist political activism that you see consistently, because most of them did not get into teaching for that reason. I'm not saying there aren't any teachers like that, but most of them you know, really wanted to get in and help students. And so, so I think that there's a lot of reforms there that would be good. We also will likely look at ways where we can modernize our scholarships. So for example, in Florida, you get a scholarship, you do the tuition, and that's good. And that's good for, for it's great. I mean, there's a lot of good things about it, but you know, there's an opportunity for some innovation with this if it's basically an account that the parent can control that could be tuition, but also could be for tutoring and some other, other uh, services. Well, then you have an opportunity, and it'd be good for some teachers, too, because you literally, maybe you have a group of kids going to a private school, but maybe there's a really good English teacher that works for one of the district schools. You could have 10, 15 parents pull together, put some of their uh, education money to that, and have that teacher tutor their kids. And so you have a whole huge opportunity for kind of micro-education, and it'll be more like not just you're choosing the school. Yeah, you're going to be doing that, but the parent will be able to make a whole host of other choices uh, to give their kids the most opportunity possible. So I think we will, we will definitely work uh, to make that happen. Final question for you, Governor, is one in which I'll take a step back from education. And I know that not only the people in this room, but we have many people watching online, Floridians, Americans, probably people around the world, I don't think that's, that's an exaggeration, are interested in hearing you answer a question like this. And it is, America has a lot of challenges. Policy challenges, cultural challenges, social challenges, financial challenges brought on and aggravated by the federal government. And yet, it seems to me that you probably woke up this morning very optimistic about the future of America. Why is that? Well, I think what we've shown in Florida is that, yes, you see all these things happening around our country and really around the world. I think a lot of the, a lot of the destruction is being motivated by a leftist ideology. And as more institutions have been captured, they've tried to effectively shove that down the throats of the general public. But I think what we've shown in Florida is you can succeed, you can stand for regular people, uh, and we can beat these elites across the board. We beat them on so many different things. And really, you know, our formula has been very simple. Uh, when the world goes mad, there's a premium on people that will just simply exercise common sense and we'll just speak the truth. And so we've done that. You know, not any, a lot of what we've done are, are, are not revolutionary. It doesn't always sit well with legacy media. It doesn't always sit well with the political left, but the broader public is like, yeah, that makes sense. The other thing we do is we ground what we're doing 
in the core uh, principles that have made this country great. And those are timeless principles. They're enduring truths. They don't always apply the same way in today's circumstances that they may have 30 years ago or 100 years ago. You know, President Reagan came in 1980 and had a great program. There were different issues then than there are now. And so you got to make sure that you're applying those principles in a way that are most responsive to the needs of, of the community. Um, and then the final thing is, and this is unfortunate that this is the case you know, across the board, it's not just for people like me, but when you're standing for what's right in this day and age, you better have a backbone. You better be displaying some courage because they're coming after you. If you're a parent, you go to a school board meeting. You know, they had the FBI mobilized even. But at a minimum, you're going to get smeared by the media. Uh, somebody is, uh, gets involved in helping candidates as a contributor. The media, if, you're, if they're helping conservative candidates, the media on the left will attack that individual. Of course, somebody like me, I roll out of bed in the morning and the left has a spasm. That's just the way it goes. But... <laughs> The point is just that standing for what's right, exercising leadership, whether it's as an individual citizen, somebody running for school board, or somebody running for governor or being governor, um, it's not cost-free in this day and age. Uh, it's not cost-free, and it's going to require some sacrifice. But the way I view it, when I'm always getting hit, people are like, don't, aren't you upset? Does it bother you? It doesn't, because honestly, dealing with all the flack is so much smaller and easier than what so many other people have done to sacrifice for us over the years. And I'll just end by this, what I think of when, when, when the, the arrows come is, I, I, you know, I was a member of Congress for three terms. I've recovered from that experience. <laughs> I didn't drink the Kool-Aid. Um, but you'd, so you'd fly up and back to D.C., and, and one of the routes that you would take would take you right parallel the National Mall. So you come down, you look out that left side of the plane, you see the Lincoln Memorial, you see the, the reflecting pool, you could see MLK Memorial, Jefferson off to the side, Washington Monument, and then a majestic view of the Capitol building. And it's like those are very symbolic and it makes you feel kind of good to be an American because you understand the ideas that that represents. But what I figured out after doing that a number of times is that the best monuments were not at the left side of the plane. Because if you looked out the right side of the plane, you would have to look across the Potomac River into northern Virginia. And the monuments there were very nondescript. Uh, they were very small. They were arranged very orderly up and down uh, so, some rolling terrain. Uh, they were the headstones at Arlington National Cemetery. And it occurred to me that you can have all these great ideas that are symbolized by what everyone was looking at the left side of the plane on the National Mall about. And it's great and it's important because you don't want to be founded on bad, bad principles. But unless you had the people that are resting in Arlington throughout our whole history that have been willing to stand up for those principles, risk their lives, and indeed in many cases give their lives, those principles would not amount to very much. And so as we get into these fights, whether it's education, all these other things, you know, I have a five, a four, and a two-year-old that my wife and I try to keep up with at home. We obviously want a better life for them and then and our grandkids and all that, and that's important. But we also owe it to the people that have sacrificed so much to make this a great country. And so we're trying to do justice to their memory. So you can attack me all you want. That's not even close to what other people have gone through so that we could be free. Thanks so much, Governor. Well, thank you all for your attention. Governor DeSantis, as you're walking down the hall, thank you on behalf of the Heritage Foundation. The lady, our friend and colleague at Heritage that made this report card possible is someone who said, Kevin, I don't need an introduction, but of course I decided I was going to. A lot of you deserve credit for this, but the lady who deserves it is Dr. Lindsey Burke. Lindsey. Well, thank you, Dr. Roberts. Thank you to Governor DeSantis. That was phenomenal. It was a great way to wrap up our day. We have had an excellent conversation all day long, including a wonderful impromptu lecture from Jay Green. Thank you very much for that.
And again, I just want to thank all of you for being here. This was, as I said this morning, really a labor of love. I am very proud of the product that we have put out. Uh, I firmly believe that Heritage and our work across the institution and at our Center for Education Policy really does represent the gold standard in education freedom. And this report card has put that into practice. It has operationalized what we hope state after state will pursue in the years to come, where every child is freer, every family is freer, to pursue an education that reflects their values and enables them to choose schools that make sure that their children can achieve their aspirations and their hopes and their dreams in the future. And so we think that this report card has really put that into practice. And again, I want to thank all of you for joining us today. And I would just conclude on a, a note from Milton Friedman, because I can never help myself, but he said that a student's education should not be determined by the government, but by their parents. And I think everybody here would agree with that, including the governor and everyone we've heard from today. So thank you all again for being here and supporting Heritage. Appreciate it.